Welcome to everyone. I know there's a lot of events going on this afternoon, so I'm glad to see uh, students here um, and some professors. Um, this, I think, is a very interesting and extremely uh, relevant talk. Um, I think it'll be, you'll find it quite interesting. There's a lot of interesting graphics <laughs> in this. Prepare yourself. Um, and uh, so uh, today, um, for the Humanities Forum, we are going to um, uh, welcome Dr. Elma Espartinez, who is coming to us from Manila uh, in the Philippines. She's a philosophy professor at the University of San Tomas, um, where she also had er earned her um, PhD in philosophy in 2002. She was a Fulbright in residence uh, in, from 2010 to 11, um, teaching ethics and philosophy of the human person at the Dominican University of California. She also has served as the v VP for Academic Affairs and the Dean of Graduate Studies at Holy Angels University, um, and recently was invited as a visiting professor for, um, at Providence College to teach philosophy and do research in the liberal arts honors program um, because of our connection uh, with the Dominican University. She has authored four large textbooks uh, entitled Big History, Logic, the Art of Reasoning, Becoming a Human Person, and Logic and Ethics. Uh, she says that her pedagogical aim is to disturb intellectual equilibrium and challenge rational thought. Uh, she looks um, to draw out each voice in the classroom and that there is not a culture of right, answered, right, right answers, but enlightened ideas. I think we'll find this is a very, very interesting topic for today. So we welcome Dr. Alma Espartinez. Thank you so much, Dr. Sandra. I also thank uh, Raymond and Dr. James for inviting me to give this lecture on uh, transhumanism and the machine became flesh and dwelt among us, prefiguring the new human in Carol Wojtyla's Christian personalism. I also thank the faculty members who came over um, despite their busy schedule, even our students. So thank you for coming and for joining me today so I won't feel alone. Okay, so here is the title. And the machine became flesh and dwelt among us refiguring the new human in Carol Wojtyla's Christian personalism. So I'm Alma Espartinas. I traveled all the way from Manila. I've been here for two months, okay? And so I'm excited to give this talk. Three questions we need to answer for this afternoon. What is transhumanism? What does it promise for the future? What is the philosophy of Carol Wojtyla, St. Paul, St. John Paul II, in relation to the human person, and what are the ethical implications of transhumanist ideals in light of John Paul II's philosophy of the human person? What if you're told that very shortly we will all vanish from the face of the earth and machines will take charge? That is a frightening possibility for us all. Better we talk about it now or forever be silent when machines have already overtaken us. Let us go back to our history, trace the beginning of human beings and ask, how did our universe start? I will now invite you to go back in time 13.8 billion years ago. Imagine you are surrounded by total darkness in the midst of this huge darkness, you heard. And this tiny object expands at an unimaginable speed. Quarks, electrons, and other particles were formed. Stars showed up twinkling in the sky. Let there be light isn't just biblical. It's science. Something unimaginably complex emerged from something boringly simple. Stars create other elements to form this 
periodic table. And stars gathered together by gravity to form galaxies. Then the evolution of life started from the simplest to the most complex, from prokaryotes to mammals. And the evolution of man begins. with this handsome man. <laughs> <laughs> and on to the future. After millions of years more, where to next for us? What will we look like a hundred years from now, assuming we still exist that far in the future? What kind of universe awaits us? Before, it was taxi. I don't know if you had it before. Now it's Uber and Grab. We have Grab in the Philippines aside from Uber. It was black and white TV then. Now it's smart TV. Before it was a slam book. I used to have it um, first grade. I don't know if you experienced that. Now it's Facebook. Desktop computer looked like this before. You remember that? Yeah, anybody who remember that? Oh yeah. Yes, okay. Now it makes use of the virtual keyboard. This was the cell phone in 1983. Now it will appear this way, folded and bended, or embedded under your skin. Before it was a floppy disk. You remember that too? Yeah. Now it's a flash drive, hard disk, or cloud computing. Before it was a brick and mortar classes. Now it's online classes and Zoom meetings. It's you and I before. Now it's you and another. <laughs> What's in store for us in the future? Things our human mind never thought before are now happening. By 2026, cars will be driverless. And what about animals? A horse will be partly machine, partly equine, but will still be called a horse. Within 10 years, we'll travel by hyperloop, rockets, and avatars. Rocket travel promises to deliver you almost anywhere on the planet in under an hour. Think New York to Shanghai in, 30 mi in 39 minutes when it's supposed to be 15 long hours or even more. As things get more complex, how will humans look like in the deep future? What is in store for the Homo sapiens? Will we become taller or smaller, tougher or weaker, smarter or dumber? Where has technology taken us today? In 1954, we have a first case of kidney transplant performed by Dr. Joseph Murray. And since then up to now, people receive a new heart, liver, lung, pancreas, or intestine, and a new lease on life. When organs are transplanted into human beings, are they still the same human beings? Who would ever think we would conquer the space Neil Armstrong was the first man to walk on the moon through Apollo 11 on July 20, 1969. So where to next, humans? Where do we go from here? Transhumanism abbreviated as H+, because they promise us to, be, to make humans more than human, started as early as 1950s and gain more adherence in 1990s. It is centered on the belief that there's still so much room for human enhancement via biotechnological innovation. The future of evolution of humanity no longer lies within our genes. It lies within our technology. You might have seen Robocop, Ex Machina, Bicentennial Man, and Alita, 
this are the stuff of science fiction. And years from now, I tell you, we would close the gap between science fiction and the real world. Sooner, a new class of enhanced persons versus the unaugmented class will be formed, outplaying, outwitting, and outlasting the normal ones. So what is transhumanism? Transhumanism is a movement that envisions a happier, brighter, and smarter, and longer life for the world, for better people. This is Kevin Warwick, the world's first cyborg in 1998. A cyborg is a shortcut for a cybernetic organism. It is a being with both organic and biomechatronic body. There's silicon implanted in his left arm that sends signals to his brain, which will eventually send those signals to a computer. With all these microchips inserted into our skin, one future day, humans will be immensely more physically powerful, more mentally skillful, and more than human. Transhumanists' creed is to create post-human species that is no longer human. It will fix what God, in creating this world, failed to fix. So what are the transhumanists' dreams? Let's have the first one. Transhumanist position number one, redesign human condition to a set of specifications determined by transhumanists, not by God. The problem to be fixed is not something that's gone wrong with humans. The problem is being human. We are flawed, we need fixing, aim for human perfection via biotechnological design. Transhumanists claim that our human nature is genetically deficient, meaning we are substandard. Would you accept that? They see the human body as something manipulable, replaceable, and disposable. All life preserving and extending technologies should be embraced, affirmed, and endorsed to make the transhumanist dream of better world for better people fulfilled. We see traces of this now. The ability of Homo sapiens to function has been improved by technological aids such as contact lenses, hearing aids, artificial limbs, inorganic parts merging with organic parts, would this partly bionic human still be part of the Homo sapiens species, especially when combined with biological engineering and nanotechnology? This is an artificial eye cornea that was 3D printed in May 2018. We'll have chips in our head to make us more powerful. Believe me, someday we will all be eventually chipped. Our friends may be robots. What if you found out your friend may be a fully functional robot in need of a charging station? You never know. A person will be half human, half machine, but will still be called a person if he can fly. And you know, parents can choose their child's gender, male or female. We edit embryos to essentially force genetic changes onto future generations. Will this future being still be called humans? We will achieve electronic immortality. And if we are already immortal, will we still be humans? We raise fetus inside the human body in an artificial womb or in another human womb we called octogenesis. We now have smart skin, an ultra-thin electronic patch for electromyography and other measurements. With chips inside our bodies, are we still humans? Through the groundbreaking technology called CRISPR, the use of CRISP-Cas9 serves as molecular scissors that can cut and paste genes in human cells. 
providing treatments to cancer and inherited genetic disorder. You can even design your own babies now, depending on your specifications. We are now in the era of designer babies. This is Neil Harbison, a cyborg based in New York. He is the first person in the world with an antenna implanted in his skull. He was born colorblind. An antenna-like sensor implanted in his head allows him to perceive colors as sound. When asked if he feels different with his technology attached to him, he said, I don't feel like I'm using technology. I don't feel like I'm wearing technology. I feel that I am technology. So here's a cyborg identifying himself with technology and not with his human body. This is Nigel Ackland, who suffered from a severe crash injury of his right forearm. Look at his bionic hand. It's truly really bionic. And this is Cameron Clapp. He lost both of his legs and an arm after a train passed him by in New York in 2001. He has prosthetic legs and arm controlled by chips on his brain. Jesse Sullivan and Claudia Mitchell holding their bionic hands. Sullivan lost his arms in an electrocution accident, Claudia in a motorcycle accident. Their bionic arms are controlled completely by thought. What if we push these technologies further? Imagine that with specialized cochlear implants, you could listen to gossips a mile away from you. Then you would know if people are maligning you at a distance. What if you could listen to someone's thoughts after tuning in to the right radio channel frequency emanating from your brain implant? Then you would know if the person you have a crush on also has a crush on you, and you truly want to try this. So there it is. Transhumanism aims for human perfection through biotechnological design. Transhumanist position number two, eliminate pain, disease, and death. Transhumanists view pain, disease, and death as a nuisance that has to be eliminated or conquered. We don't have to suffer according to them. We don't have to die. We don't have to go through all these pains that leave us miserably hurt. Look at those people who suffer from debilitating diseases, from COVID-19, from cancer, from all sorts of unmerited pains. If we improve them genetically, we can somehow prevent all this undeserved physical and emotional torture, not to mention the hefty cost of hospitalization. Transhumanist position number three, eliminate humans. Not only should we eliminate pain, disease, and death, we also have to eliminate humans. For transhumanists, the aim for perfection necessitates self-annihilation, the abolition of humans. Once consciousness is uploaded onto a computer, we can make humans live forever and ever and ever. In the process of aiming for human perfection via biotechnological design, transhumanists plan to make human extinct and let technology take over. The kind of immortality transhumanists promise is a virtual existence via mind uploading. I tell you, in just one microchip, billions of human minds can be uploaded Istkov, a famous transhumanist, is now preparing to surgically transplant a human consciousness into a robot body. It won't be far behind. It's coming near. As the saga of human enhancement heats up, another camp is battling it out to prevent this from happening. I now present the arguments against transhumanism from St. John Paul II. As it is, St. John Paul II attacks the normative propriety of embedding implants, touching the neurons, and other bodily interventions. 
Transhumanists want human enhancement for human perfection through bodily modifications. Human enhancement for John Paul II is an attack against human nature and what it means to be human. The human person, according to John Paul II, is a unity of body and spirit, making him a spiritual, free, rational being made in God's image, not in the image of a robotic body or a robotic machine. John Paul II cautions us in Veritatis Splendor against manipulation of the human body, which would alter its human meaning. The human body reveals the person. He says that in his book, The Acting Person. Understood this way, significant enhancement employed to the human body, especially to the nervous system, without consideration of its spiritual nature, is a violation of the divine design. So let us not belittle ourselves by allowing ourselves to be formed in the image and likeness of a machine. The human body is sacred, it is holy. God meticulously formed us in our mother's womb. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. Biomedical intervention is a betrayal of the truth of the human body. There's an ongoing therapy enhancement debate and let's differentiate therapy from enhancement so that we can have a better grasp of what is allowed and what is not. Therapy is the prevention or cure of disease in order to return to normal physiological function. Enhancement, on the other hand, is the alteration beyond the normal functioning of a human organism that includes regenerative and nanomedicine replacing healthy human organs with artificial and superior ones. From here we can see that enhancement has nothing to do with any medical condition. It is not even medically necessary. It's just about boosting our human capacities beyond our nor normal range of functioning, pushing our intellect beyond our natural limits. Brain implants could mean, listen, dear students, the end of schooling, as anyone will be able to learn anything instantly. You don't have to memorize and study because everything is already uploaded to your brain. For transhumanists, there is no issue whether making me better is through therapy or enhancement. We cannot just be limited by our human condition. So the question, is enhancement necessarily unethical? There is also a difference between moderate and radical enhancement. Moderate enhancement is the improvement of human attribute to levels within or close to what is currently possible for human beings. The operative word here is within our limits. Examples of moderate enhancement may be like wearing makeup, hair dye, going to the gym, for muscle toning. These are examples of enhancement that are within our natural limits. No surgery, nothing invasive. Radical enhancement is the improvement of significant attributes and abilities to levels that greatly exceed what is currently possible for human beings. The operative word here is greatly exceed our limits. Permanent invasive change in the person, like brain pacemaker, maybe rhinoplasty, facial threading, buttox podding, and bust lifting, maybe some of those. So radical enhancement becomes problematic now. We should draw the line between what is necessarily medical, necessary medical intervention that is ethically permissible, that is therapy and what is unnecessary and ethically impermissible, which is radical enhancement. When you want to augment yourself or enhance yourself beyond your biological capacities or physical appearance, 
we did not translate into a substantial change or advantage for you as an enhanced person? In other words, surgery for purely cosmetic reasons involves a rejection rather than an embrace of the person's natural God-given bodies. Plastic surgery that is not medical therapeutic can be aggressive towards human identity, showing a refusal of the body. Cosmetic surgeries are cases of idolizing physical per perfection. And once physical perfection is achieved, satisfaction shifts to another. As human beings, we are hardwired for discontent. Further, the person is a human being in his unique and unrepeatable individuality with preeminent dignity. That's according to John Paul II. It follows as strictly necessary that he be treated with absolute respect according to his incommensurable value and dignity. Our human body that reveals our person prevents us from treating the body as a machine that can be manipulated for one's own purpose. If the body is a machine, then it can be owned, bought, sold, rented, repaired, replaced, and removed. We are not machines. John Paul II speaks of personal growth, and he termed it self-fulfillment, not by transcending our current biological limits, but in and through our actions, expressing self-determination, self-possession, and self-governance. Now the question, are these cyborg's actions considered the act of the machine or the act of the person? Or are they already human machine actions? In his book, Love and Responsibility, Wojtyla maintains that the person's non-utilitarian value prevents the body from being treated as an object of experimentation because of the human body's inherent value, because the human body is an integral part of the entire human person. And his personalistic value demands that he be treated as a human person who should be loved and not used. These are the person's non-negotiable values. With a person's non-utilitarian value, John Paul II warns us, thou shall not use. And with a person's personalistic value, he tells us, thou shall love. In short, human persons are not meant to be used like machines. They are meant to be loved as persons. In his theology of the body echoed in Evangelium Vitae, St. John Paul II is quite insistent that the body must not be regarded merely as a vessel of the soul. All of man's bodily life is also the life of the soul. Therefore, human enhancement that transgresses the genetic boundaries is in every case evil. Going beyond our limits is moral trespassing. Now imagine that my contact lenses, I'm using contact lenses, and this is 500, I'm legally blind, could use augmented reality or could see you in the dark and could even see you without your clothes on. Transhumanists want to experiment on us and see how far we could go. They don't bother to ask, is what we're doing the best thing for humanity? And certainly not the thought of what are the long-term ethical implications of what we're doing here? They don't care about ethics. They don't care at all. Still further, transhumanists want to remove pain, suffering, and death. Pain, suffering, and death, while apparently negative, according to John Paul II, are integral elements of human condition. We all deal with sickness, suffering, and aging, and we know too well the salvific works God can do through these human experiences. 
Diseases should not be regarded as a genetic scandal, as some transhumanists seem to think it is. Aging provides the opportunity to embrace our vulnerability and our limitation. Pain and suffering are human realities that allow us to speak of God in the midst of human grief. I refuse to romanticize human mortality and fallibility, but without pain, how would you know happiness? Without death, how would you appreciate life? It is human facticity, fallibility, and contingency that make human excellence truly honorable and profoundly meaningful. To be human and not to die is a metaphysical mistake. This is tantamount to abandoning my very humanity. Only the mortals and the vulnerables are truly courageous, tenacious, and resilient, for they know fully well that life is not forever. The immortals can never be heroes. The human body is not under repair. Our human body, no matter how deformed it may be, is not and is never considered a factory defect. I've undergone six major operations. I might have some body parts that are really deficient, but I still love my body. People become so obsessed with perceived flaws or defects in their bodies. Our human dignity entails embracing our deformities, our defects, our fragility, and honoring such limitations as part of our human being. We are all fragile beings. To tamper with human nature or adjust the human person through any form of biotechnological enhancement, such as consciousness uploading, human cloning, embryonic stem cell, is to cheapen the human person. Don't you want to be loved for who you are? or for the plastic surgeries or cosmetic modifications that prevent us from seeing you as who you truly are? And why would you want to hide from all of these imperfections? Who said aquiline nose is better than the snubbed nose? I am Asian, I have a snub nose, and I don't care. Who said that white skin is better than dark skin? Why change the contour of your face just to satisfy other people. Aren't you good enough? Aren't you worth keeping? Response number three. Transhumanism is a wishful thinking. It is pure speculation, promising and threatening to remake the world. Homo sapiens will one day become more than human. Machines dwelling with humans, replacing flesh, with steel and silicon imbued with immortality, seeking the next day to become God. In strong terms, I say transhumanists' position is purely selfish, revealingly atheistic, and abysmally duplicitous. In summary, transhumanists have these arguments. One, Redesign human condition according to a set of specifications determined by transhumanists, not by God. Second, eliminate pain, disease, and death. And third, make humans extinct. Transhumanists want to make humans better and then wish him gone. John Paul II argues that one, Radical enhancement is a form of dehumanization as it violates human nature. Our human nature has certain limits we have to respect and honor. Modifying it genetically beyond its teleology is an abuse of our power, a dehumanization and an insult to our God as our intelligent designer. Second, pain disease, and death are the person's facticity. Part of our all-too-human condition is our fragility and mortality, our pains and sickness. 
All these form our very humanity, which we don't surrender to artificiality that transhumanism proposes. And third, humans will be humans. Post-humans are no longer humans. We are not rejects. And we are not to be reduced, reused, and recycled. We're not plastic bags. There is glory in our human flesh. Do you know why Batman is more heroic than Superman? Superman is willing to face his enemies because he knows he is indestructible. That's not heroism. Heroism is tested when one faces death, saving people despite knowing he would die. Batman, in all his vulnerabilities, is human, all too human. Batman does not have radioactivity, alien heritage, or high-tech armor. Batman is a self-made hero. And because of his being completely human, because he doesn't have superpowers, unlike Superman, Batman is the real hero. That's personal. So what future awaits us? Will the future still need us humans? Where should we draw the line between improvement and destruction? Technology is here to stay alongside digital tattoos, implants, patches, exoskeletons, and wearables. Thus, we should start philosophical debates, or else human genes will become toys of the gods. There is nothing wrong with technology, and we don't want to stand in the way of those technological advances that can ease pain and suffering. But we want to promote the use of the technology in a way that promotes the dignity of the human person as John Paul II envisions it. Let us engage in ethical conversations to ensure that technology is used in a way that avoids exploiting human beings and robbing them of human dignity, human value, and human identity. This is who I am, and this is the way I want to stay. Let the transhumanists do whatever they want to do with their science-enabled engineering. But don't touch us humans. Improve us, yes, but don't change the natural way we are. Look at some people who have succeeded despite genetic deficiencies. Albert Einstein, Abraham Lincoln, Charles Darwin, Thomas Edison, to name a few. They were the famous failures. Were they radically enhanced? When asked, how are you? As human beings, we are broken, unhappy, scarred, heartbroken, sick. But as human beings, we're still fine. Just as God in the Bible designs and creates animals and plants and humans according to his wishes, now we are learning how to design and create life. From now on, your name is Kara. My name is Kara. Initialization and memorization checked. Humans are present with many, many others from their species wandering around on this planet. As naked apes, we once tamed fire and afterwards every form of new technology determined our development. Now that we've cracked the code of life, it will not take much longer before we can start to play God. The big question is what kind of gods we will be? Will we be in merciful and wise gods, or will we be uh, petty, vengeful, and irresponsible gods? With our biotechnology, artificial intelligence, and nanotechnology, it seems we possess all the ingredients to start our own process of creation. But how to deal with this, and what does it mean for our species? 
Those are big questions. Can you hear me? Yes. I think that this is going to be the um, the agenda for the next century, is, is that we will be involved in deciding, either individually or as a society, who we want to be. What does it mean to be a human? This is backlight. Will we become gods, or are we making new gods? Are we necessarily the end of the line of adaptation? Will machines kill off the human species? Will transhumanists still listen to us? Are both camps still open for dialogue? We're team human. The word became flesh and dwelt among us to recover that truth and raise humanity to dignity befitting human as human. For John Paul II, our creation in the image and likeness of God, our capacity for moral transcendence, our self-fulfillment in and through our human acts, reveal our human nature as possessing a dignity beyond compare. Let us not surrender our humanity. Let us not allow this machine to take flesh and take charge. Optimistically speaking, the future will not be up to the cyborgs. It will still be up to us humans. We've got to stop transhumanism now, or we might be impotent to stop it. Let's not pass the torch of evolution to our digital successors and fade into oblivion. Once again, I am Alma Espertinez from the Department of Philosophy, born and raised in the Philippines, and proud to be an unaltered human. Thank you. Um, I'm go uh, we usually we start um, by asking if students want to pose a question. Um, this is a very complex and rich topic. Any students? Mateo, I knew you would. Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming to give this talk. Um, so I wear glasses. Um, I'm not legally blind, but I do you know, have pretty bad eyes. And yeah, and, and you, you mentioned you wear contacts. Um, it, it would seem to me that, uh, you know, s such a drastic use of uh, our ability to create as, as that of, you know, fitting glass materials, fitting plastic materials, which themselves are our creations to our eyes so that we can make up for a deficiency goes beyond our limits. Um, could you... Could you uh, perhaps explain a little bit more as to that, that boundary, please? Thank you. You made mention that these plastics go beyond our limits. I think um, even other Christian personalists would say that it doesn't trespass yet because it's, there's nothing invasive about it. Uh, there's something pathological maybe because we don't have the 2020 vision. That's why we make use of these contact lenses and you make use of those eyeglasses. I think there's nothing invasive. It's just normalizing what we used to enjoy before when we had a 2020 vision. And so that would not be considered as a radical enhancement and that would not fall under transhumanism. If I got your point. Oh, father, brother.
Yes. I think in Salvifici Dolores, John Paul II was, um, was very um, eloquent in saying that suffering is part of our human existence. No one is born without um, the possibility of suffering. And this suffering is even salvific because we can find meaning out of this suffering, merited or unmerited, because there are lots of people who already suffered so much and yet would not want their bodies augmented or like replaced because they see that there is meaning in what seems to be meaningless. So what John Paul II is saying about human suffering um, and uh, diseases and death is that it's part of human facticity. When we are born, automatically we know that we would die sooner or later. And so it's part of our contingency and facticity that we'll be suffering, that we'll be going through all these pains. And theologically, we may even say that this human suffering has um, uh, a salvific uh, impact because we're now getting closer to embracing God's suffering as well. What I think now that is happening um, is that for transhumanism, they don't want any form of suffering. They don't want pain. They don't want to, um, they don't want any disease. And so as much as they can control it, they want to, to do it. But the beauty of life, Father, is that we can always find meaning in all of this. Uh, recall those victims of Holocaust, Viktor Frankl. He, he, he was able to find meaning in his incarcerations, even if he, wa he was incarcerated four times uh, in the concentration camp. So all of this would still have meaning. But of course, for transhumanists, if you can get away with it, why not, why not do it? So that's precisely the reason why transhumanists for the Christian personalism would view it as something materialistic, um, Altogether, um, what uh, the purpose would be eugenic merely and perhaps even solipsistic, uh, but generally it's materialistic. The people is only valued by his or her economic utility. Other than that, uh, they don't see anything valuable in human suffering and in pain. If I may say this, um, um, you know. In the Philippines, I think we only have five homes for the aged, for your information, because we take care of our old people, the dying. Uh, we don't just send them to home for the aged, we take care of them. I take care of my mom who is 90 years old, my dad is 90 years old, my brother is a special child, and we see beauty in all of this. Yeah. I hope I answered your question, Father. <laughs> that was a long answer. Thank you for talking on this, something so interesting and, um, and really relevant. I, I just was reading an article about somebody who got a, a microchip implanted in his hand um, to check out uh, at a grocery. I mean, he can pay for things with just swiping his hand and. Uh, that would get me in a lot of trouble, but I'm not. <laughs> uh, anyway, no, my question is, so you were talking about the transhumanists and transhumanist positions, and um, you didn't really talk specifically about any particular person who was a transhumanist. I was just curious, I mean, how many, how, how large a movement is this? Uh, how many people out there are talking about this sort of thing? Um, and perhaps if you could mention a couple of names that would be interesting um, for anybody who wanted to do more research into it. some names, no? Okay, like Harbison, yeah, and Clapp, and all of them are transhumanists. Um, I think there is one presidential, um, Zoltan Itzvan, 2016, who is a transhumanist in the U.S. You've heard of his name? He, is a, he has an implant, okay? He has this uh, ultra-thin microchip um, embedded on his arm, okay? So he is, uh, he wants to uh, change uh, Americans into better humans by embracing transhumanism. That's what I've heard so far. We, we don't even know, ma'am, if 
uh, were seated beside a transhumanist or someone who is a cyborg because they might have like uh, ultra thin uh, plastic inserted in their bodies. Ma'am, we have lots of them now. Lots of them. Um, uh, how do I, I, I value them? Well, we respect their decisions, but how far can they go? That we don't know, but we have already lots of transhumanists. They are even promising that in 2025, 2022 now, three years from now, they can deliver immortality. How they would do that, that we don't know. Yeah. Scary, I, I don't know. That, that's, that's extremely disturbing. <laughs> um, I'm interested in the, the third position of eliminating human beings. Uh, can you say a little bit more about that because is the idea that we would be replaced by machines completely? So why would we need machine? Why would, why does there need to be something that's not human running the world? What would be the point of it? Or is that just a, a transitional point while human beings are being eliminated and then we shut the machines off? I don't know. Yeah, thank you. Actually, there is a shift from transhumanism to post-humanism. Transhumanism, Transhumanism is just a transition from being human to being a robotic body. And then eventually there will now be post-humanism after that, okay? So I think we're now in the era of transhumanism when there is already like uh, mind uploading and they're doing it now, okay? Uh, the problem is uh, when, when your mind is uploaded on a robotic body, okay, if this is just an example. Supposing you're the mind of Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein will live forever, okay? So because the, the consciousness, the mind is already uploaded. How they do that, we, we, we really do not know. But the point of transhumanists is to preserve these human minds so that they can live forever and ever in a robotic body. But the problem is, what if Albert Einstein, supposing his mind is uploaded, would want now to not to live anymore? So who would put an end to that machine? So that would be problematic as well. So what the transhuman, transhumanism is just the first stage for the transhumanists. What they want is really post-humanism when there's no need for human beings, it will only be just robots. Indeed, the machines will dwell upon us and there will be no humans anymore. Whether it will happen or not, we still do not know because that's still talking about the future but that's their goal, that's their telos. If they want, what, uh, eternal salvation for the human body, for the human person, that is the kind of eternal salvation they want. That's why Christianity and transhumanism are incompatible. Am I complicating it more than, oh, oh. My dear friend. Oh, well, actually, we have two over here. Uh, you can shout, and then I'll let, I'll give her the. Okay, go ahead.
comments. First would be the recommendation. I would want to get the titles of this, uh, and I'll be watching that. The second question is about anti-essentialism. No? Uh, yes, it's not just about technology or biotechnological design. It can also be considered as an attack against our essence because um, um, there will be now anti-essentialism. We don't know now what human identity is, the race, the gender, and all of that. And, and that's, th that's correct. And I, I agree that transhumanism would also deal with that. Like, we're still groping in the dark and trying to find what our essence is. And to say that this is it, it would really be essentialism of St. Thomas. And that's the reason, perhaps, why even Carol Vertiu or John Paul II would not want the essentialism of St. Thomas because it is so fixed, um, uh, it's unchanging. But what is important is that there should be a phenomenological aspect to it, that, there could, that we still welcome some changes because we do not know uh, what really the human nature is or what really is our human essence is. We're still trying to find it out. And you are right in your third comment that there is what we call, according to John Hott, who is not a transhumanist, but is a very good um, theologian, John Hott, who made mention that we're, we welcome the deep future. Because we do not, like in my presentation, from prokaryotes to mammals, there would be thresholds, there would be milestones. Anthony, we don't even know how, uh, how a human being would really look like in the deep future. And so to say that there's nothing more to know about human beings because we already captured it would also be doing injustice to who the human person is. And so like, um, like Schopenhauer, Schopenhauer for, for me, no? uh, sorry, that's your field, okay? Because I find, it, I find him somehow as a pessimist philosopher but he's uh, saying a lot also about human nature and the uh, Nietzsche uh, of his Superman. That's why, Dr. Anthony, I would even say that perhaps what transhumanists would want really is not to destroy the humanity or human being, but only to make him like a superhuman, not really changing human nature, uh, like what uh, Nietzsche would say. But of course, I don't want to dwell on that because uh, I don't have imprimatur from Anthony. He is an expert on Nietzsche. So my only point is this. First, about anti-essentialism, I agree with that because we cannot really capture the essence of human being in, in a Thomistic philosophy. Sorry for the uh, Dominican friars here. I'm also schooled at University of Santo Tomas, so it's highly Thomistic. But yes, but I also am so open to the possibilities of um, like really knowing more about who this human being is instead of just saying that that's all there is to a human being. Uh, we're open to what the future holds because evolution is still ongoing. Uh, Pierre Tejad de Chardin uh, is an evolutionist and he's, he is a Catholic and he's open to that, okay? Um, uh, consciousness is evolving, and we just have to accept uh, whatever the future uh, will tell us. Let the future surprise us. I hope, Dr. Anthony, I answered your question. I just had a question on um, when you talked about how there's going to be no schooling and stuff like that. I just I just was wondering why, like, how would that society work? Because then everyone rem remembers everything. And then are they gonna be doctors? No, because everyone's like, oh, I can be a doctor. And they would wanna be, and they would wanna like make the same amount of money, be more richer. So I just don't know how that society would work. There would be no working class. It's, it was a lot. So I was just wondering if you knew. promises of transhumanism. You just have that uh, microchip uploaded on your body with all the information that you need. You don't have to review. You don't have to study at Providence either. You have everything to know already. Is that um, impossible? I don't think so. They have done so many um, marvelous things, surprising things. I don't think that would be surprising. 
and I think you're interested in having that. Okay, no, uh, of course, uh, um, yes, um, that, that would not um, uh, make sense of education anymore if that would be the case. That's why they would say, if you really want the human minds to improve even human education, transhumanism is pro-education. That's the kind of argument they would say. Transhumanism is pro-education because they just want really to, um, uh, what is this, upload more information that a student would need. Uh, whether it is true or not, that we don't know. But it's maybe just to entice us into embracing transhumanism. Yeah, um, you know, whenever we engage in a conversation, I think we just have to be honest with our position. You can take any position, okay? You can, uh, my position is Christian personalism, okay? There could be other philosophers who might um, uh, embrace transhumanism in their philosophy or might be against transhumanism. What is important is that we talk and debate about all of this just so that we can come up with like, what do we really want our world to be? Um, we just have to be open about that, okay? Some may not favor Carol Wojtyla's concept of like uh, embracing uh, pain and suffering. They might have another philosopher um, to back them up. That's perfectly okay. There is also another philosophy which is process philosophy or even process of theology that would say that it's like transhumanism because process theology is open to creation. Creation is not final yet, okay? Uh, but uh, even Carol Vertiwa mentioned that process philosophy and our metaphysical God, our Christian belief are also incompatible. We can come up with different positions and that's a healthy discussion, okay? What is important is that we know, we know how to engage in a debate we're open to dialogue and uh, we're still open to changes.
the answer to that? I don't know either. Yeah. Uh, it's here now. Okay. It's within our midst. How do we, uh, how do we de deal with that? We really do not know. But we just have to, like, um, uh, hold on to our Christian beliefs, if that is what we believe in. Okay. You know, I remember when I discussed this with, with my students, and they read the article, and they said the following day, they told me, that was scary because they really don't want to disappear because that's what transhumanism is trying to do, okay? That they still want that. They still be humans here on earth, okay? And not just like machines with our minds uploaded in, um, onto this robotic body. What do we do? Uh, my invitation uh, in this paper is just to continue dialoguing with it, okay? And trying to make sense of what, our Christian beliefs uh, would tell us about the dignity of a human being, our uniqueness, our irrepeatability, our human identity. Uh, we just have to hold on to that. Doing something more than that, we don't know anymore. But my, my position really is to let's talk about it. And I think people will still be listening anyway. I'm not even really sure how I want to ask this question. Um, it's, it's, it's such a utilitarian approach to uh, the human being. Um, and I don't see how, how this movement can, can account for or even value in any way um, uh, creativity, um, participation in kind of beauty and creativity and it reduces everything as you said you know it can be downloaded in a microchip um, but that um, that's so limiting it's just whatever can be codified in a in a microchip that's that's what counts and that's what's going to go forward um, rather than um, I mean I think what what Anthony just said kind of it really struck me I mean the reason why we we have identities is because it's the way that we interact um, physically and spiritually and emotionally with the world. And, and if, we, if we're not interacting emotionally and physically with the world, then we don't have an identity. I mean, my identity is in part, in large part, determined by you know, when I was born, what I look like, who my parents were, my gender, you know, my uh, intellectual limitations, all these different things. And just replacing that with a with a machine, um, I'm trying to put my finger on it, and I know that's everybody else's too. But I, and I'm, I mean, I'm looking over at that painting, and and I'm thinking, well, we could get a robot who could produce that painting exactly, but or even better, or even better, and yet there's a there's a creativity and a, a symbolism and a meaning that I don't. I don't see how that's how that's reproduced through this. Am I wrong about that? That really makes us unique because the robot would not be able to do that. I mean, uh, uh, uniquely, okay. Um, but when we do it, even if it's not that perfect, our human uniqueness is displayed on that particular painting. Even our human actions, our human actions may be less than what a robot can do because definitely a robot can do better sometimes than we can do, but this is our human acts. I am defined according to Carl Wojtyla by the very human actions that I perform, and my actions are truly unique. They're all mine. The way I talk, the way I deliver the lessons, the way I walk, and the way I move my hands, that's uniquely Alma. No robots can ever duplicate that. And that is what Carol Vertiwo wants to highlight, that kind of uniqueness in all our human actions that make us truly human, because that's what um, his book is all about, the philosophy of the acting person, that the person is always acting and his actions is all, are always personal. That can only be done by a human being. A robot can do it.
I had something I wanted to say, and I will say, but I'll say something in response to um, Dr. Keating first. Yeah, I, I was thinking along your lines, too, that if you transfer the memory bank that Albert Einstein had at the end of his life into some kind of machine, is that Albert Einstein? I don't think so, because the way the brain functions, it's connected to a whole body that moves in space, and I'm, I'm not sure that could ever be done. But I, I was struck by when you were about halfway through describing Carol Votiwa's responses to um, the proposal of transhumanism. He uses the word significant, so no significant alteration, right? And there's the rub. Um, and so I imagine if we had this conversation for six hours and we brought in thousands of people, um, we'd most want to talk about where's the line. I also imagine that the, the hundreds of thousands of people who work really hard to um, repair cleft palates for children or do heart transplants or use CRISPR to make it possible that a person you know, genetically coded for Huntington's disease won't die at age 42. I, I don't think 98% of those people are thinking they're contributing to transhumanism. I think they think they're doing something to alleviate human suffering without dreaming that they're eliminating suffering. And so I think in having the conversation with most people there who are involved, they're gonna say, I'm, I'm reducing instances of human suffering that I'm able to reduce. I consider that a benevolent act, whether they're religious or not. Um, I, I'm not dreaming of eliminating suffering. And for goodness sakes, boredom is suffering. How do you eliminate that? You know, Albert Einstein in a machine is bored. I mean, there's, there's, there's all of that. But so having the conversation of where is the line um, I, it seems like it would be an interesting one. And then my very last thing, which is much briefer, I'm just not sure arguments, I always, I face this myself, do arguments convert, you know? Or does someone who walks through the world not fixing a large nose, but seems free and self-accepting, does that person's presence invites someone else away from their discontent with their appearance. I tend to think being around people very comfortable in their own skin tends to be the most converting kind of presence, whereas, uh, you know, arguing about it, it just, it's like, wait a minute, you don't know what it feels like to have my nose. Do, do, you, know, do you know what I mean? Anyway, those are just, they're not answers. But you said at the very beginning, we're not about answers, we're about enlightened questions, right? Well, you did your job then. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, first, I made the distinction between um, therapy and enhancement. If it's something pathological or there is a deceased part of the body, that's okay. That's the reason why. I had a surgery because there was something uh, deceased in my body parts, and I welcomed it. I did not undergo surgery just because I want to enhance my body parts. So I went under the knife simply because there is a need for that. There should be something that should be eliminated in order for me to function well. That's not enhancement, that is a therapy. So we just have to note the distinction between what is morally acceptable and permissible and what is medically unnecessary because they're healthy anyway. Sure. Of, of course, there will be <laughs> several cases of this. So we can really see, we won't um, run out of examples of all of this. But being diminutive, for example, if you are diminutive, uh, that's, that's how we were created. And if people would realize that there are people who are diminutive, there are people who are 5'10", there are people who are 6'7", and that's the kind of height that you were given, and that's not a defect at all, um, perhaps people would just simply accept oh, oh, their, their, their nature. Nick Vujicic, perhaps you've heard of him, 
an Australian uh, American uh, who who does not have arms and legs, but are not, but is now a famous what uh, speaker. Um, yeah, he was able to um, overcome his uh, um, his uh, limitations. So, yeah, and and then the second one, I think there is a quick answer to that. Oh yes, yeah, yes. Yes, that's correct. Um, when you have a cleft palate, if there will be difficulty of you talking, um, then it would be better that uh, for therapeutic purposes that it be remedied. And so I don't think that is enhancement. Those who have dyslexia, those who would not be able to distinguish D from B, uh, they, may, uh, they may have that kind of like a disease and they can be corrected. And I don't think that is enhancement. Enhancement would be doing something more than what we should have. So going beyond that, that would now be a radical enhancement. But like treating some, uh, even the brace, my, my student asked me, uh, Professor, what about wearing brace? I heard that even wearing brace can sometimes um, um, make you hard to talk if it's not aligned, the jaws, okay? So if there is a need for that, because that can, make you function better, then that would be acceptable. Something etched into my mind. I read in the Facebook, there is someone who really wants to have a rhinoplasty because he has a snub nose. Oh, by the way, I always say snub nose because Socrates is one of the ugliest philosopher, and he has a snub no uh, nose, but I tell you, he is the best philosopher <laughs> that we have so far, and I like him. He wanted to have a rhinoplasty because people are talking about his snub nose. And every day, whenever he would open his Facebook and he would say, there are people who are ha having their nose done, and then he said, oh, I really want to do it. I really want to have uh, 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 a nose change. And then after a month, when he opens his, um, his Facebook, he does not see any picture of this anymore. One month, two months pass by, and then he said, I'm now okay with my nose. I don't want a rhinoplasty anymore. So I don't know, is it just a trend? It's simply because people are talking about it? That's why you want a change? Is that necessary? Yeah. I think, Father, you know my position regarding this, and uh, I'm not really for any uh, radical enhancement. Neither would I uh, uh, vote for like mind uploading and uh, consciousness uploading. I don't think so either. I don't think so either. Uh, or even if they just in case they may be capable of doing that, um, perhaps they would not really be able to capture that kind of identity that they want to do with that kind of human uh, or, or mind uploading. Um, 
it would definitely be a totally different species, not really that kind the, the person where they took the consciousness from or the mind from. So whether it, it, it's possible or not, personally, I don't think they would be successful in doing such. Thank you, Dr. Martinez, again.